I bet most of your people who've sat in this chair, it's not about what college they went to. It's about their own initiative, their own drive, their own ambitions, their own curiosity. I can say from the era in which I grew up, I don't give a rat's ass what you say to me, okay? You can only be ridden if your back is bent. On my tombstone, I want the epitaph. Be ashamed to die until you have scored some victory for humanity. Many people look for meaning in life as though it's gonna be under a rock or behind a tree. Well, there's my meaning. You have more power than that. You have the power to create meaning in your life rather than passively look for it. Meaning to me is, do I know more about the world today than I did yesterday? That enhances meaning for me. And if that accumulates and, and accrues daily, in a month you, you know way more than you did than just that day later, so that you continue to grow. My first question of me wasn't, where do I find meaning? It was, how do I create meaning? And that started early, early teens. You can draw a line in the sand between people who transgress, but do not hold power over you. This is a famous quote from Martin Luther King. You can only be ridden if your back is bent. When I grew up, it was very common to hear the phrase, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words will never hurt me. I haven't heard that phrase in a long time. I don't hear it recited in the elementary schools. What I think has happened over the years is, we came to learn as a civilization that Words can be hurtful. That's an advance in, in mental health. What I see on the flip side of that coin, however, is people are less able to deal with the very same people who are around today who were around back then, who are calling you names. I can say from the era in which I grew up, I don't give a rat's ass what you say to me. Unless you are between me and some goal, then I'll have to navigate that some way. If there's a racist person or a sexist person or a person with some kind of cultural bias. I want to know that, actually. I want you to say everything you want to say. Then I'll say, okay, that's who you are. That's how you're thinking. So now what do I need to do because you're in my way? Do I dig under you, go around you, leap over you? Or do I go this way and then come out the other side? Yeah, it's longer. It's more effort. It's more energy. But on some level, it's sort of same different day. I can't say you're being racist, you're being, I, that's not, you gotta navigate it. I think high school, that's where you learn how to deal with difficult people. There are people who are nasty. You're gonna have to navigate them. There are people who you cannot interact with for whatever reason or another. They're gonna be in the cubicle next to you in your workplace. So I think we undervalue the total social pot that people are tossed into in their high school experience. They want to say, oh, I could have learned more, but I had to deal with all these people. Hey, having to deal with all these people is now in your portfolio. Your motivation for the guests that you have in this couch, they, they had some vision statement and they have grit. Okay, they got knocked down, they stood back up, they tried another way, they got knocked down again, then they were successful, either measured by wealth or influence or, or just joy in their life's passions. For me, what I do for the public, 80 plus percent of it is driven by duty, not by ambition. That's how I view it, if that were the case. This is how I ended up hosting Cosmos in 2014. Anne Drillian, the widow of Carl Sagan, who is hugely talented, she approached me and said, would you consider hosting Cosmos? I said, I don't, there's a dozen people, maybe half a dozen others, who would jump at this opportunity. I don't need to do this. I really don't. And then I thought about it and I said, well, I had met Carl Sagan when I was 17. I was applying to colleges. He was at Cornell. I had been accepted at Cornell, but was, didn't know what college I wanted to go to. And the admissions office saw that I wasn't totally in the moment there. They had forwarded my application to him for his reaction. And he sent me a letter. And I get this letter and I open it and it says, I understand you like the same stuff I like. Uh, do you want to come visit the campus to help you decide if you want to go to Cornell. He met me outside his building on a Saturday. Something really cool, he reached back, grabbed a book off the shelf. It was one of his books. And he signed it to me 
Neil Tyson, future astronomer, signed Carl. Later in the day, I'm ready to go back to New York. It begins to snow, as it does often in December in Ithaca. And he says, here's my home number. If the bus can't get through from the snow, spend the night with my family and go back tomorrow. I'm thinking, who am I? Why? Why? I'm nobody. But I was somebody to him. And I said to myself, if I'm ever as remotely famous as he is, I will treat students the way he has treated me. If we can fold this memory into this, this next cosmos, then we have a way to justify who and what I am as the next host, because a torch got passed. It wasn't passed in 2014, it was passed in 1975 to Neil Tyson, future astronomer. I still have that book. And what is a, an adult scientist? but a kid who's never lost the curiosity. I bet most of your people who've sat in this chair, it's not about what college they went to. It's about their own initiative, their own drive, their own ambitions, their own curiosity. That is not taught in school, sadly. School, they view you as this empty vessel that they pour information in, and you test it over here, you get a high grade, you're praised. You might even give the commencement speech. Is that who become the shakers and movers of the world? I don't think so. When you come down the steps on the last day of school, you are not singing the Alice Cooper song, school's out forever. You'll be, there'll be a sad song you'll be singing, saying, gee, I gotta go two or three months without learning anything? You should be sad that school is over, not happy. And so you leave school, and you say to yourself, I now know how to learn. I now have a curiosity of all things I have yet to be exposed to. And I will now become a lifelong learner. I read things that take me to places where other people think. What was it about your dad that impacted you so much that you still carry today? For me, at least, was uh, what level of wisdom did he glean in his life and then successfully communicate to me, either by example or by just explicit statement. In high school, he was in gym class and they were lining up and they were about to enter the next athletic unit and it was track and field. And the gym instructor pointed to my father online and said, Cyril Tyson, everyone look at him, he does not have the body type that would excel in track. And he says, what? No one is going to tell me what I can't do in my life. And he used that as a reason to start running. Within a few years of that, he became world class. In 1948, the Olympics was not yet ready to come back to us because we're still reeling, roiling from the Second World War. Instead, there was still an Olympics. It was called the GI Olympics, and it was held in Hitler's stadium. Wow. So he competed in Hitler's stadium uh, in the late 1940s. But the reason why I'm saying all of that is, there's a friend of his named Johnny Johnson. They were competing against the New York Athletic Club. The New York Athletic Club at the time accepted only white Protestants. So there was another club called the Pioneer Club, which took everybody who was not accepted to the New York Athletic Club, which was basically blacks and Jews. And his best friend, Johnny Johnson, Okay? It was coming around the back stretch, might have been the quarter mile, coming on the final straightaway. And a runner from the New York Athletic Club is a few paces behind him. And Johnny Johnson overhears that runner's coach say, catch that n And he overheard this. So what did he say to himself? He said, this is one name he ain't gonna catch. <laughs> and that extended his his, his lead to the finish line. And he tells this story not with any bitter tone. It was, here's an occasion to parlay what today might be called a microaggression into a reason to excel even more than you had expected of your own abilities and talents. Okay, my last question, what's the impact you wanna have on the world? My impact would be people learn from me in a way that they are empowered by what I taught them. 
so that when they think of what they learned from me, they no longer think of me. They think of their own base of understanding of how this world works. I become irrelevant. And because if people say, this is true because Tyson said so, then I failed. That's not how you teach someone. That's, that's teaching them by authority. I don't, you know, that's, no. I wanna, I, I wanna teach you how to think about the world. And then you say, I have a new way to understand the world. And you just run off, don't, you don't even look back because a new level of hunger has descended upon you and methods and tools to feed that hunger are now accessible to you. So my impact would be that others are impacted and they don't even remember that I had something to do with it.